It's another beautiful Friday morning here in Lagos. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the program. I am Nifemi Ogunsoye. Friday means a lot to Lagosians, perhaps because it's give them that short break from the hustling and bustling to relax and enjoy time with friends and family. Even though for some people, the hustling continues even on weekends. Uh, well, it's just 10 days into the year, and already our attention has turned to the issues of national security. Just last night, our Cardinal State correspondent reported the abduction of some four uh, young men in a seminary in Bielsa State. Already, the abductors have reached their parents, and uh, they are saying they will call back to let them know uh, what will come next. I also recall that I spoke with our correspondent in Ondo State a few days ago, who mentioned that about three abductions have already taken place in the first seven days of the year, even right here in Southwest. Now, recall that six months ago, the six governors in this region came together at a particular security summit organized by the Development Agenda for Western Nigeria to discuss uh, issues following Syria killings in this area. We recall issues of kidnapping, gunmen suspected to be headsmen. Last year in June, I'd killed Funke Olakunri, a daughter of the Feniferi leader, uh, Ruben Fasaranti, on the Ondore Road. In May, a lecturer at the Obafemi Awolo University, Lefe, Professor Layinka, uh, was abducted also uh, on the Ibano F. If an expressway in Ikire. So these governors came together, decided to come up with an operation which they have now called the Western Nigeria Security Network, otherwise known as Amotekun. There's a lot of issues uh, around national security. On the show today, I'm joined by Chris Ekio, who is President Emeritus of the Ijo Youth Council, a trained dental surgeon himself. Good morning and thank you for finding time to come. Morning, uh, I really wonder how you marry, you know, dental surgery with um, <laughs> youth activism and all of that. I'm also joined by a senior colleague who is a journalist, veteran, Wale Adeoye. Thank you very much for finding time to come. Well, since you are here, let me begin very quickly to identify the fact that it appears abduction is no no region of the country now has a monopoly of abduction. They say the Southwest have learned very well from the region where you come from. But let me begin very quickly before we turn our attention to the Southwest to find out what your thoughts are as President Emeritus of Ijo Youth Council about how the amnesty program has performed in the past uh, 10 years thereabout. The essay to the President recently had called for a comprehensive audit of the 10-year program. They are saying it's, it's the same 30,000 people who began who are still there. Some of them, he particularly mentioned that is it that no people or no person died in the past decade how do you react to just how well it, it's performed in the past years well um, this morning you know we're talking on security mm -hmm. and I think the entire amnesty program itself is, is hinged on security of our nation um, uh, fast forward I mean rewind to 10 years ago the the, the, the Niger Delta was the boil of conflict and the kidnappings the killings and the, uh, the abductions were high there the amnesty sort of was a window where we we were when I was president then so we were able to get people out and then recalibrate them and debrief them. Uh, looking back ten years, we all have our misgivings. Did we get it right? It's something wrong. Uh, why really? Why why do we have to spend five billion every month uh, to, to for the same number of people? Uh, nobody is being settled out, out phased out of the program over a period of ten years. Now that would be uh, questions for the managers of the program currently to answer. Because uh, the program had a blueprint that had four prongs: the 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 uh, what you call the mobilization, debriefing, reintegration, and of course the last point, which was the investment point of it, which, which cost the government then to create the Nigeria Data Ministry and then to provide what you call the ten percent equity uh, in the uh, NNPC from the JV, so that that can go straight to community development, and then also. Um, the security outfit, which then was supposed to be the coastal guard, because we had in the debriefing process where they said some people are skilled towards gun running. Now, that energy can be directed positively into the security agencies. We suggested then that the military could recruit them, the police could recruit them, or a special force for securing the pipelines, the coast guard, or securing the waterways can be created, just like what is happening now in the uh, uh, western region. Definitely, looking back, Except and otherwise that the, the auditing of that place is properly done and, and, and maybe certain questions cleared. I do not think that the program is having its purpose anymore. It's just like a bribe for peace 
and the people, the current handlers, seemingly... Are the Niger Delta people getting the peace? That's, that's what, no, no, bribe for peace. What, what has happened is that the government is more concerned about taking oil. And so long as we can give these boys 65,000 or give anybody who matters 65,000 to make sure that they don't blow up pipelines, the JVs are producing oil, then we have achieved the goal. Now, that's mm. a failure, mm. a complete failure. And the managers of the program, the current managers, need to know that they are failed, whether they like it or not. Because the idea, in the first five years, most of the achievements of the program were very clear. We had capacity building in the areas of aviation, in the areas of seamanship, in the areas of uh, um, oil and gas, in the areas of education. That program produced lawyers, doctors, engineers, uh, oil and gas um, technicians, uh, riggers, uh, pilots, um, caterers, mm -hmm. who either two should now be placed in job and exited the program. But they're all still in the program. Why? Because there's no follow-up to consolidate on those training. In these last five years, I do not know whether there's any training going on. I cannot see anyone. I can see vendors complaining that they, they have been given delegates to train. They have not been mobilized to do the training and those who have finished training have not been paid so then they have seen vendors complain that they have been asked to build to do what you call capacity building and then create entrepreneurship for those who have been trained and they're complaining every day i see delegates themselves saying they don't get their stipends anymore so there's a confusion there's a mix of a situation that's like a time bomb that can spiral back into 10 years again where you have new set of crime uh, skills emerging especially now with these people now more exposed in that 10 years before, most of them were in their locality. With the amnesty, they have now traveled to Lagos, they have traveled to places, they've seen things. And like you said, if the Southwest could have learned well from them, then you can imagine that they would have upgraded themselves with the social media. That's all right. So I wouldn't want to go there. And that's mm -hmm. why I think what the Southwest governors are also doing is key and strategic. We'll probably we'll get back to that in the course of the program because we understand that a lot of money is being pumped by this ag administration into that region. The president talked about some $10 billion for the development of the Niger Delta some few years ago. But let's bring this discussion to Southwest. So um, security, insecurity is insecurity anywhere. Yeah. Uh, we are being told now that the army and the police are different, are from different places. And so they may not know the terrain as much as the local groups. And that is what has now prompted the development or the establishment of what we now know as Amotekum. Number of personnel to be supplied, payment structure, roles that these members will play in the security outfit are germane questions that we should be asking right now. How do you react to that? Uh, these are of concern to everyone that lives in the Southwest. But let me say that the idea of Amotekum is a component part of the strategic roadmap developed in around 2011 by the um, Southern, uh, by the by Dawn, Development Agenda for Western Nigeria, which was established after a retreat by Yoruba uh, elders in uh, around 2000 and some years back. Uh, Dawn feels that if you look at Lagos up to Delta Edo, it used to be Western region because they had shared values, shared culture, shared heritage. So if we are talking about security, uh, securing lives and properties, there should be a kind of cooperation between the component states, you know. So that also brought the idea of uh, dawn. And then uh, in June this year, there was a retreat, another retreat at the Badon. And uh, after that meeting, there was a three-day summit, strategic meeting. Yeah. Some of us were part of that uh, meeting. And it was at that meeting that was, that name came up, which was suggested by a professor that we should adopt the name Amotekun. And uh, to... Amotekun means tiger, right? No, leopard. Or leopard, you yeah. know. So that it should address the issue of security in the Southwest. Because as far back as 2011, you know, uh, the leaders had been worried about strategic threats. We had the crisis in Libya, which started in 2011 in the Maghreb region, which led to proliferation of arms. And they knew that the Southwest being um, the hub of the industrial base of Nigeria, many displaced people in these areas will be compared to South Kometo toward the Southwest. So there's going to be a uh, change in cultural demography, there's going to be consequences on the social and uh, economic relations, yeah. you know, and also the crisis in the Middle Belt, which displaced a lot of people, all of them coming to the Southwest. And a lot of people also commit crimes in other places and run to the Southwest, you know. So they felt there was a need to map out, you know, a regional uh, strategy beyond the garrison structure of the police, you know, that's going to reflect the cultural and social milieu of the people. So that also gave uh, birth to Amotekun. And uh, the states are looking at uh, recruiting 1,200 across the six states, mm. which in a way is a very small figure. That's just about maybe the number of police you have in uh, 
Yanapaga, you know, or Limoshonu government, compared with about 60 million people in the Southwest. But what is important is the capacity of these 1,200 people in terms of uh, equipment, in terms of uh, intelligence, you know, in terms of ability, in terms of integrity of the individuals you know, that, that make up this organization, yeah. and also in terms of public trust and their knowledge you know, of the terrain that they want to, uh, to protect. Uh, when we are talking about equipment, we are talking of something like a DNA, a forensic lab. Lagos has a forensic lab, which is an advantage. It means at a crime scene, a strand of air, you can take it to that DNA, analyze it, and discover the kind of person that is responsible for that kind of crime. So I think the issue is not about the population of people, which is just 1,200, but the capacity and the level of training that will be given to this individual. So I think it's a very welcome development. But I also think beyond that, um, the governor should be thinking of cooperating with governors of Southwest. Okay. Because people commit crime in Southwest. You know, who are European people? Are in, they run to South, uh, South, South. The same thing people commit crime in South, South and come, you know, to Southwest. I read in the paper sometimes ago, Sokoto State Government had a part with Niger Republic because they were, you know, trying to cross border crime. So Amotekun and the Southwest leaders is not out of place. Those who have uh, work at the kind of regional cooperation with ECOWAS state. So and I that brings us to yes, yeah. to the to the idea of um, regional collaboration as a means of um, fighting insecurity. Now, there's a lot of reaction trilling uh, what was established yesterday. Mm -hmm. I'm going to quote a portion of the Nigerian punch to you. Uh, one of our correspondents gathered on West Day that some elements within the presidency, as well as the police high command, were not favorably disposed of the regional outfit because they consider it as part of restructuring agenda uh, the Southwest had been pushing for. How do you react to this? Yeah, yeah. No, no, so that's the that's the dirty shades of politics. Mm. Uh, people don't see uh, uh, people. Uh, politicians are always pessimistic when it comes to South South and the Southwest. The reason for that is that the South South people and the Southwest have been very vocal, and they just start today from in the fifties about fe true federalism, about um, um, regional governance, about about self sufficiency, and about um, um, resource control. Now that's not to say that there are no resources in the north. The way the country is skewed with the unitary system has made the northern region to virtually just think that oil is just all we need to run the country. The north is far, far endowed than the southwest and the southeast in terms of solid mineral mm -hmm. and natural resources. But we've not explored, explored that. So there's always the fear that each time the south-south, for instance, the Brace Commission is, n is not allowed to function. Mm -hmm. The Brace Commission would have been a wonderful commission that could have created a regional rail track, a regional highway, regional security outfit to make sure that from cross rivers, to um, a do here is kind of secured and all this kidnapping and all these things is, these people are familiar with the terrain yeah. so they're able to think her when they see strangers among them just like what is happening here but there's always this palpable fear each time the, the people from the southwest or south south or even the southeast so it's, it looks like it's a northern fear over a southern yeah. uh, uh, creation why are we agitated these are people who have said that we want our people to secure us the, Call it whatever name is, the local vigilante. That's the real word. Mm. Vigilante groups, night watchmen. Mm. That's what it is. It's not a police force. It's not a, um, a military outfit. It's night watchmen or uh, megads. What the house of people call megads. People who look around and get information, news, find new people and say, hey, what are you doing here? Hand over to the police. It shouldn't cause the kind of public fear. There is a clear operation of a civilian JTF ongoing in the north. Apparently. It's been there perpetually. Mm. And the, the, they are armed to run. And recently, you're talking about Sokoto, the Borno State Governor had created a joint patrol with, within Cameroon, Chad, and itself. Mm. And have given, even donated, federal government's vehicle, mm. Nigerian's money, to another country. Mm. You know, I don't know the constitutional powers that the governor have to interfere, in I mean, with, from one country to another, because that's, right. that's the, the federal government's power. Mm. But he has done it. Nobody raised an eyebrow. Yeah. The civilian JTF have arms and they're supporting the system. So I think what the police should be looking at is what is the intention? What the presidency, those people they were worried, should be looking at what is the intention. In any case, I do not think that the presence of 1,200 armed men will be the reason why uh, the Southwest will want to break away. If they need to break away, they will work it through the process that they know how to go about it. Yeah. But I, Nigeria, for me, I've always said that it's better as Nigeria. The only thing that is lacking is mutual trust and respect for uh, the regions. Let's tr let's uh, attempt to scratch the surface and dig a little deeper. So we're told that although members of the Yoruba groups, including the OPC 
hunters, vigilantes would not join the patrols by security agencies, but uh, they had now been slated for intelligence gathering. Now, you and I know what the relationship has been prior to this time between uh, security forces and the citizenry. Yeah. So there's this um, uh, not much of trust you know, in between the two. So you see a policeman and then the perception of the average Nigerian to the police, for instance, isn't, isn't very, very kind. But look at the constituency of these people, the OPC, the hunters, the vigilantes. Do we have a track record to train them properly? And how do you see them relate with security agencies? Well, the, the fact is that OPC is the feminism for pan Yoruba groups. But in reality, there are about 25 of them. You have Yorem, you have Kosek, you have OLM. There are so many of them who have been existing for so many years. In fact, the first group in Yoruba land was Odua Youth Movement, 1994. Uh -huh. So there are so many of them. The reality is that uh, these guys have a kind of, what I call a kind of oath, traditional oath, to protect the, the, their, their territories. So it's a commitment to protect their people and then the properties in those, in those territories. So uh -huh. they have that ideological consciousness that look, this land, we have to protect it. And I think when you are talking about security, uh, there's no way they will not be involved. Already they are involved. Communities are being guided by them. They're almost every community, you see them. The hunters, the pan Yoruba groups, they are the ones who are protect those communities. So, and I think, unless the police, some people in the police force, because there's no uh, official statement that the police will not work with them. But maybe some people want to be mischievous. They have been working and collaborating with uh, uh, the pan Yoruba groups, either OPC, OLM, or, or whoever. They supplied them information. There was a crime incident in, uh, in Ogun State. They, they, were, they were the one that went into the bush, the one that happened in those, on those state, the same thing, even the one that happened in Epe. Yeah. So to, to now come and say you don't want to cooperate with them, I think it's a uh, double speaking. They are, you know, they are speaking from two sides of the mouth. So there is no way you have this kind of protecting the lives and properties of people that they will not play one role or the other. And what we are talking about training, you see, the most important training is knowledge. Knowledge about the environment that you live, knowledge about the sociology of the people, the culture, the heritage of the people, the geography. If you are a professor of uh, security, if you come from the United States to my village, somebody is just about 12 years old, we floor you, or you go to um, you know, Patani, or you go to uh, Ekeremo, and then somebody is just 20 years old. You say you are a professor, you, you know the terrain. It will, it, will, it will floor you because he was born there, he was raised there, he will go inside water and spend about one hour. You will still be writing papers. You understand the point? So when we are talking about knowledge, there is no way you, the knowledge you have, you acquire in, in the university or in the police can surpass the indigenous knowledge that people have about their environment. Absolutely. The way I'm not talking about training in terms of intelligence gathering. Ha, fella says, uh, I'm in uniform. Now police, they swam now. I mean, I tell all the swarm. So it, what is there in just giving, I mean, teaching people on how to gather intelligence or how to analyze intelligence? These people are educated. So that one is not a big deal. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you are talking about combat, it's not every security man that needs to be involved in combat. And uh, security is not just about combat. It's not about carrying guns. You know, when, if a Mossad is operating, it may not necessarily carry gun. So when we are talking about training, it's just about people carrying AK-47. There are all lev levels of training that people can be used to without necessarily taking up arms. Dr. Chris, this looks like the community police that uh, the Southwest and some other people have advocated for for a long time. Uh, but uh, the fact that it's the operation of these individuals is going to be limited to intelligence gathering, yet they're wearing uniforms, yet they already have patrol vans. Uh, uh, they are talking about um, also empowering them with technology like drones and the rest. I'm concerned about the track record of jungle justice, the track record of always associating security with force. And that's what we've seen play out in recent past. How credible, I mean, how, how capable do you see this individual, local hunters, the OPCs, you know, the vigilantes group, fitting into this particular structure? Uh, let me tell you how I would have helped the police if I was government. Only yesterday, the IG had, uh, yesterday the university had appointed 40 new CPs. It means that there are more than enough CPs in the country to man each state. Mm. Uh, if I was the IG, I would rather have a CP in charge of this kind of operations and assign some uh, uh, covert police operatives uh, to work with this group and provide for them uh, 
train in terms of shooting range, mm. um, assess their capacity, and know the caliber of weapons they are using in terms of type rating, mm. and then work with them by creating a hub. So they're not, they don't really have to run through the conventional police process. They know which channel of police to quickly deal with for rapid response. Right. Like the Abakari team, it's very clear with what it does. Mm. So a desk can be created in the police force to deal with this kind of community policing. Yeah. Maybe with an AIG or a DIG with some CPs for the, I mean, you know, running, running the regional system where this kind of network report directly to that desk and that desk filter it through the police system and regulate and check and make sure it's within the ambit of the law. Mm. Now, the issue of use of force is everywhere. The military does it, the police does it. Mm. And perhaps the only people that have not seen really, even the DSS went to court for mm. so hard to do the same thing. So, so it's, it's about the individual and the rules guiding them. If, they, if those who are now enlisted have been trained to behave appropriately and there are sanctions that, and there are consequences for bad behavior, and one or two are used as guinea pigs to show example when there's such a bad behavior. Others will pick up. This same police force we're talking about in the 70s was a straight police force in the country. Mm. They didn't take bribe then. It was difficult because when you were caught, they dressed properly and they were trained. Right now, what has happened is the backlash of what we're seeing is the reflection of our today's society. Is it in road? Is it in healthcare? Is it in security? There's a decadence in everything. So I think that so that the governors don't, get, don't, don't mix politics, they must clearly provide the funding, the, the, the blueprint, and allow trained security agencies to collaborate with them. Otherwise, that suspicious agenda will be there. No, For but, community but policing... Just a minute. But how, how easy do you think it will be to, you know, uh, merge or bridge the tr trust deficit that currently exists between the force citizens and, and citizens? Yeah, yeah. So, so that's a police responsibility. Citizens at all times would have loved to trust their police and military. It is the conduct of the police and military that are put the distrust on citizens. Okay. I travel globally, and sometimes I wonder why we don't accord the same respect that other co citizens accord their police and, and, um, and uh, the military. For instance, you're flying um, international and you're going to board a plane in the US to Nigeria or to anywhere within the US. The first set of people who board are the military. They don't carry guns around. They just see them in the uniform, sit in the corner, dissociated from them, disconnected from the people. Once they say they were ready to board, they say people, servicemen should go in, business class and all of that. We don't have that here. We don't respect that. Why are they, those people doing that? Mm. They know that those men in those uniform put their life in the front line for them. Every evening in, in the county, you see two, three policemen walking around. They see three adults knocking the door. They walk up there and say, yes. They, they knock in that same door and say, Mom, or oh, sir, please, are you safe? We saw three young men in your house. Mm. They do their job without asking for bribe. Here, the men sent out on patrol, whether military or police or whatever, as soon as they're going out, it is, they call it their own cocoa farm. Mm. They have to make money. They have to return money to the office. The office has to return money to somebody higher. So every influential individual also have to pay the police for mm. personal security. I think that there's a breakdown in the, in the strategy, security strategy for the country, where citizens will continue to suspect the police by their conduct. This can be corrected first from internally uh, generated principles in the police force to sieve out that kind of behavior. Let me bring in Mr. Adioye. So how does this work if that is not fixed? If there is a up, if there's an apparent crack, you know, what is now been, been perceived as an apparent crack in the Nigerian police force, how do we expect that the Amotekon guys will be able, no matter how fantastic their job is, uh, what if there is an evident perception that that intelligence is going to be compromised? Well, I, I think we, we had striking examples in the past, like I said. So all we need to, to do is to revive that heritage. Mm. And that, I think that has to be reflected in the, the quality of training that will be given to members of Amotekon. They should be made to be distinctively different. Mm. But don't also forget that in spite of the rot in the system, we have um, a kind of, we have striking examples of certain individuals in the policemen, just like in the general society, that also continuously show that, you know, they represent, you know, the good, the good old days. So I think what is important is to ensure they emphasize, I mean, place emphasis on the quality of training, integrity, including the more health, the, part, the way you look, the way you dress, you know, and uh, they, they need to do a lot of background check on those that they want to recruit, you know, and make sure that that training is continuous, you know. 
uh, is you know most of the time uh, the, the government emphasizes training on uh, you know using force and all that. But what is important is the, the, the frame the frame of the mind. You need to train the mind to have empathy, uh. to have commitment, they, to the society that they really want to defend. So I, I, I think we are looking up to a situation where the Southwest governors will learn from their own heritage in the past, which they have done before, and give quality training to this, so that even the police people, the army, can see them as you know, very striking examples that they can learn from. Already there are talks about ethnic militias. I'm going to quote um, um, one of the stakeholders who talked yesterday. They cannot use them only for intelligence gathering, but should... Uh, be trained to work under the supervision of the Nigeria police and other security agencies. Criminals, according to this individual, will not respect them as mere informants, and they will be open to attacks and killed like chickens. Security is about life and death. The police and other security agents can train them, license their gun use to greatly assist in the operation. They should not detain suspects but hand them over to the police. So how, uh, the perception here is that, how do I investigate or interrogate a suspect uh, by being an informant. Uh, how much respect do you well, think well, well, this individual is? I honestly, I'm looking at the papers and the motive of this Amatekun. I do not think that it's just for intelligence gathering. I expect them to be armed with licensed firearms, calibrated to individuals, mm -hmm. and then so that in case those weapons are also used, the ballistic um, test can also prove who it was used on. I don't think that if it is intelligence gathering, the communities are already doing their bit. Mm. They need to, it is the reinforcement of that intelligence gathering and supporting uh, the police to pursue crime, crime and criminals mm. is why this is coming up. Mm. I expect, like I said, that to, to, to bridge the gap so that they don't just go to conventional police and report and then the things is put under, a special desk be created. And I cited Apakari, those ones in the, in the IRT group. They know their job, so they follow it through and they don't compromise themselves. The guys are arrest Evans. So if you create a desk with an integrity, there are integrity police officers still existing in the Nigerian police, then they can't compromise them. Find those ones and ask, create a desk so that reporting is channeled to that desk, so it's not compromised. And then these guys must be trained to be able to defend their community and defend themselves against aggressors. You don't expect me to go to tell you that there are some headsmen here, so let's go and look for them. Even the police will not go alone. So that local intelligence, it's what we reinforce, that, that we motivate the police to go with even those people. If those hunters and those um, local uh, guards are saying, we will go with our community, because there's what you call compassion. Uh, it's my community, so I, can't, I, I have no other place to go, so I'd rather stay here, fight and die, than run away. We'll push these guys to stay and protect their community. It will strengthen a policeman who probably initially was afraid to say, if these civilians who are just not as trained as me can do this, and braving this person up, and that's what happens in a war situation. Mm -hmm. What we have in our country is some kind of clandestine local wars, pockets of wars in every sector of the country that we are managing in a way. So I think that the most, I agree with this writer, they must be trained, censored, uh, with sending low caliber weapons that at least can put up a resistance before the military can come in place. Otherwise, <laughs> I don't think it's going to survive it. But I think they're already doing that because if you provide them with security vehicles, you must provide them with security gadgets. If you're talking about drones, you should be able to have pump, pump actions mm. to, to support those drones. All right, let's take a short break here. When we return, we'll turn up the phones and get reactions from uh, the viewers. Stay with us and don't go away. Thanks for staying with us. Operation Amoteko, we are told, is now in full force across the six states in southwest Nigeria. And we're looking at issues around national security on the show this morning. Dr. Chris Ekio, uh, Mr. Wali Adioye, thank you, gentlemen, for staying the course on the program this thank morning. You. So there's a lot of talks about um, whether or not we're going to see other regions follow suit in this light. How much of community policing is actually taking place uh, right now in the Niger Delta? All right, um, I, I know that there's OSPAC in um, River State. Um, these are community police kind of thing, and they have been able to stop, I say stop completely, 
what if the police and the military didn't stop on the East West Road? They kidnap a whole bus. In fact, in one case, they killed the policeman and took a 30 seat coaster bus of commuters. And it was on and on, and the River State government decided that we need to take our destiny. <coughs> and they mobilized their community youths and the communities, and then the uh, Wiki Red Israel Act. And then the communities went, and like you said, they took local oaths. These OSPAC guys in River State went into the den of those people mm -hmm. because they're familiar with the bushes. Mm -hmm. You can't come to our bush and control our bush for us. They went in, they got locals who were conspirators, who were kidnappers, arrested them, handed over to the police. Some died in the custody of the police you know, shoot out. They went, got headsmen, evacuated them from the point, and the road is seemingly safe. If they are sustained and maintained, and they continue to work in collaboration with the police, they'll be able to weed out these killings that are going in the bus. In fact, the one that the guy, there's a guy who was busy killing girls in hotels, they mm. tracked him down. Mm. Now oh, that was a work of the local vigilance. Yeah, mm -hmm. local, the, the, the track information. Mm. Now, in my neighborhood where I have a hospital in Port Harcourt, if your thing is missing, just go to Ospark. The mm. next day they find it for you. Interesting. Because they just call it. So people you're saying that, that it, it's it's working in that region. They call the people that they know mm. I will do this kind of thing. They mm. call one of their leaders mm. and say, "Look, we will take you down if you don't find it. That one will not sleep. He will start running around until he finds the information." And let's then, take let's take this call from Ben Wistay. Good morning, Emmanuel from Otupo. Good morning, Nifemi. Glad to have you call. Good, good morning to your guests in the studio. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. They, are do, they are doing a very good uh, job on this program. Thank you. Um, I want. I want to commend the people of the Southwest region for this uh, operation Amotekun. Uh, let all the naysayers please hold their peace. And let all the pessimists watch and see as this program will turn and be successful. You see, we need programs like this in the six regions so that we can checkmate the nonsense that is happening in the country. What is happening in Northeast is a disgrace, a national disgrace. I don't expect, I didn't expect that it could last this long. We have soldiers, we have all the security agents and the police, and it is lingering on like this. I don't think it's fair. But if we have uh, people like this, of in all the regions, they will easily pick out the criminals and nip every crime, every crime at the board. What I want to advise the governors is the member of uh, Operation Amotekun, they should be placed on oath. Under Shango, <laughs> that is what they are going to fear. They will not fear the, the Bible and they will not fear the Quran. Okay. But they will fear Shango or Batala. When they place them on such oath, they will perform to the best of their ability. And other regions will see the success and copy. Nigeria will be better for it. Thank you. God bless Nigeria. Thank you for your contribution, Emmanuel. So he's saying that they will fear Shango more than any other. <laughs> <laughs> What's the economic implication of this? 1,200 individuals now will join the payroll of the state governors. Already we know that um, each state had given, I think, about 20 patrol vehicles to yeah, this um, course. Mm. Uh, at a time mm. where okay, the union leaders are threatening to go on strike, they're asking, they've given them about 21-day ultimatum now yeah. to s start implementing the new minimum wage. What are the realities that you foresee in this light? Well, I don't think it should disturb the economic equilibrium of the states. Um, each state is going to probably 250 men, okay. you know, and um, most of them, or some of them, will not be full time. For instance, if you are a petrol attendant, you can be you can be into intelligence gathering. Yeah. If you are a vendor, you can be into the intelligence gathering. If you are a mechanic, you can be a member of Amotekun. Because when people steal cars, they, are, they, will either, they must go to petrol stations. They must go to mechanics. So you can, the mechanic can pick the chassis number and then report to the central command and then the information is passed on to the police. Mm -hmm. So there are, there are, I believe there will be a lot of volunteers who naturally have their own uh, work where they earn a living. Probably at the end of the month only get some stipends. Mm -hmm. So 250 people per state, in the state for, in the Kitty State for instance, I don't think it's going to create, uh, disturb the economic equilibrium. So I don't think it's really In addition to, to all of the infrastructures and tools. Yes. That yeah. the and I think they're also yeah. thinking of, uh, of course, the, the Southwest um, Trust Fund, you know, where there'll be a pool of resources together. And I can assure you because security is, is a local affair, but it has international consequences. 
I see the international community also showing interest. Let me hold you for a minute support. to take Yakubu's call from Dokwemu. Good morning, Yakubu. Yeah, good morning, Mr. You're welcome. Uh, Mr. Ajay, good morning. And good morning. Then, uh, the former uh, oh, is, uh, leader. Good morning, sir. Thank you. Uh, you have been you have been a great uh, uh, job there in, in that studio this morning. I'm talking about your students. Uh, you see, let me start. Let me start from where the last caller stopped. Uh, Mr. you may look at it as a laughable thing, but for me, let's take it serious. Very laughable something. Mm. What did I say is this very, very serious thing. Here in the Southwest, we, we believe in a culture, and then if you don't believe in a culture, why can't you do what did I say? Mm. Because the reason is this. There is no how you have 1,000 people that will not, be, will not have some sabotage within them. Mm. So in order for us to, to be able to cause such things, if you put them on that very particular kind of code, you see, God, of God, the Almighty God is a merciful God. He will be looking at you, maybe we say, we say, we say. But what the guy says that place them on the table of the moon. Oh, you, 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 you say, welcome to development, you can do that. But I would say that, yeah, uh, and listen, you see, this is a kind of uh, state security that we are talking about. You see, if there is no civilian JCF in northern area, the success that the military made that place, the club not be able to get there. You see, the United States says, yes, the Boko Haram killed some of them, but they still giving a very, very high level intelligence to the, to, to the military. Because even in my locality here, you cannot carry somebody from north or from the Niger Delta to come and police in my environment. It can't, it can't get it. Because we that we live in the environment, we know who is who. If somebody, a stranger, coming to my locality here today, we will be able to point out this is, this is a stranger, we don't know him. You understand? Mm. So, give, give kudos to those governors. And then I, I, will, I will suggest what one of your guests says. I think it's a very, very good thing. I mean, the legal data guy. He says that these people must be able to give a kind of weapon, a register tally with their name. Because you cannot talk, you cannot follow a criminal with just ordinary intelligence. What about because these people they can go inside the booth. Yes, they have sort of uh, something I don't want to mention a local guy by themselves. That even though you pump a gun to them, you may not be able to see them. Right. If even if you pump guns to them, the gun may not be able to to, to see that. That is a fact. But the, the, the government was able to, to fight from certain ammunition to them and register right. that they are named. Thank and God bless you. Thank you, Jacob, for your contribution. Yeah. Maybe they do not need arms after all. Uh, it, it, since, since they are going to swear to oath, they yeah. should also use charms, I mean, to defend themselves. Let me also tell you this. Yes. So I'm traditional. I'm not mm. Christian or Muslim. I'm very African. Mm. So the, the, um, it is true that um, this, the Orthodox religions have been able to water down the issues of what we're doing, mm. but they exist. They do exist. They do exist. I'm talking from experience. So I will not. I, I was not laughing because I don't think that is not possible. Okay. I think is that it, that I was laughing because I think that uh, this guy believes in tradition to be able to do justice more than the other mm -hmm. one. So for me, whatever they are going to do to get it right, including fortifying themselves, is it's okay by me. Yeah. But let it not be something that will snowball into a. A regional militia. That's mm. why I said there must be a death because control in the police force. You recall we had the Bakasi. Yeah. There must be mm. a death control in the police force that was monitor them. Somebody who is, who is tested and trusted. Absolutely. There must be a synergy between the Nigerian police and this because there's a constitutional, there's a constitution in the country, there's a constitutional, a constitutional provision for security outfit. Mm. This is unconstitutional, but it is hinged on probably section 20 of the uh, Justice Act that says that um, you can, an individual can arrest. And hand over to the police. So a group of individuals definitely should be able to organize themselves and take out a criminal from their midst. And I support it. But we should not water down what, what the last two speakers said about some form of thing that will put discipline culturally. Because it's a cultural group, the name in itself, Leopard mm. means a lot in the Yoruba heritage. Mm. So it therefore should have some cultural connotation. How they do it is their own internal uh, mechanism that we shouldn't. But that doesn't mean that they should, even if you have all the champs in your body, at a point, you want to give fire, you want to give cover fire, or you want to <laughs> also shoot back. Okay. Uh, so the charm is defensive. You need an offensive weapon. Exactly, That's what we're talking exactly, about. Exactly, uh, exactly. So let's let's look at the political implication of this. So the Southwest, over the years, especially since 1999, has been uh, traditionally uh, what they call the progressives. Uh, 
as we speak now, Oyo State um, is PDP. Uh, that's yeah. where the headquarters of the Amoteko is, with an operational base in Osho State. How much of collaboration do you see among these governors? For instance, the Oyo and Osho State over the years have had issues with managing a state university by the name Lautec. I mean, they almost wrecked that school. That's my alma mater. And then you wonder, even at the point when both governors were from the same political party, it was very difficult for them to work together uh, and make good of that institution. How do you see all of these work together, especially now that we're looking at a regional approach to uh, security? Well, I think the creation of states has its own advantage. The disadvantage also is that it has turned uh, people with common history into atomic societies, you know. And uh, when you don't have the right leaders in place uh, that don't have a very deep sense of history, that's when you begin to see this kind of uh, friction. For it, I mean, we, we are we are the same people for, from mm. the same root, from the same background, the same history. Mm. So the states are just artificial creations, you know. We speak the same language. So any good leader that understands that uh, political parties will come and go, but the people will remain. That's right. You can change from APC to PDP, but you cannot change today. I want to change from Yoruba. I want to become an Alsama. Mm. It's just not possible. Let's so, take let's take this call, woman, and then I'll get back to you. Omoba Joshua has called in from Isayi in Oyo State. Good morning. Yes. Good morning to you, sir. Good morning. Uh, well then, you are doing very wonderful work there. Thank you. Uh, God bless you this morning in the name of Jesus. I mean, just so. Um, I want to commend the governors of uh, the Southwest for this uh, great thing they are starting in the Southwest. Uh, but I want to beg all uh, citizens of uh, the Southwest to cooperate with uh, the, our governors to make sure that this uh, material succeed in our region. This morning in my family, in my house, during our morning devotion, I led my family into prayer for our governor because of this and the members of the Amateur group. As I know uh, what Nigeria is, look at Nigeria police. When Nigeria police first started, they were very wonderful. They said Nigerian police was not doing good. They gave some of their work to road safety. We know when road safety started, they were wonderful. We know what road safety is today. They gave the job of police to the custom. When custom started, they were wonderful. Look at what custom is today. Immigration and the rest of them. So I'm a tech, I'm a tech one. Uh, the work they are giving them now is the work that police are supposed to do, but because our police are not... Uh, are standing uprightly, and that's why they are giving them this job. We, we, uh, it, the Bible tells us in Psalm 127, verse 1, that unless the Lord watch over the city, the watch men, they start guarding them. I want to beg everybody to pray for our governor, pray for the summer taking, that they will succeed, All right. they will do well. We are living in fear in Southwest, mm. except we want to deceive ourselves. Except what this disaster. So they need our support. I can All right. see from your link now that yes. some people are already criticizing them. Mm. They're already saying it's uh, something to our nation. Leave them. Leave I them. think you made your point, Omoba. That's how much time can permit us. The Lord must be ready to work with Songu on this one. Yeah. <laughs> from yeah, what yeah, we've heard yeah, from yeah, previous yeah, callers. Yeah. So you are quite optimistic yeah, that I'm, I'm these governors can work together. Yeah. Just to buttress what he mm. was saying. Mm. Yes. You see, security challenge does not have shades of parties. Mm. It, this, it, it cuts across all parties and all colors and all tribes. What's good for Southwest is good for South South. It's good for South East. It's good for uh, North Central. Uh, just uh, the geopolitical reasons. Mm. I also do not agree that it's because the police uh, couldn't do the job. That's what I'm bringing. You know, I mm. think that there's a shortfall in the manpower of the Absolutely. police. Mm. So that gap that exists is what yet this to make the UN bat my, uh, benchmark. benchmark in that regards. But let's turn to the South-South and see whether we can learn one or two things. So yeah. we've seen a program, uh, we talked about the amnesty program earlier in the course of the show, where federal government was paying a group of people for a period of time, trained them for a period of time. Um, not exactly the same thing, but we're going to see some state government involvement in training these individuals and also perhaps pay them some stipends. Did that automatically resulted in some sort of 
loyalty, patriotism, and commitment on the part of these young people who were involved. Okay, so what is common in these two is uh, between the Niger Delta and here was the security unrest and mm -hmm. um, loss of lives and properties. Whereas in this case, invaders and local criminals are threatening here. In that case, indigents took up arms against government and then it spiraled into mm -hmm. a Robin Hood kind of thing where they begin to fight themselves and destroy mm -hmm. communities and kill people. And we needed to stop that. So uh, why did the amnesty come? If we were able to take the guns without getting an amnesty, they would be prosecuted for crimes against the state. Mm -hmm. So we had to put the amnesty caveat so that they can turn off the guns. Now, the federal government also, knowing that a day loss in oil, is is less it's, it's it's not what they're spending to manage the boys in one year is not it's not, it's, it's not up to two weeks production so a day loss in oil will affect our economy so it's for economic gain that the federal government got involved however the states also play their role governor Dwan then um governor silver then and uh, particularly Dwan and silver were very very much key in, in ensuring that the, the people in the creek had confidence in governance. And of course, the presence of the then uh, vice president was Jonathan from the region, reassuring them that the federal government would grant this amnesty. And of course, we must give credit to the president, Yaradwa, who took the bold step against, just like this, it was, it was kicked against by the security agencies, but he took the bold step against the security agencies to, to move it forward. I can tell you that those kind of crime that were arising from that trade, do not exist that much anymore. So the people who kidnap them now are doing that from the sidelines, like it's happening everywhere. Mm. It's like a national crime. The, then the headsman Wahala is there. Then you have the bunkering, which is now thriving because there's a conspiracy also between the security agencies and the local bunkers. There's always a conspiracy theory. So that's what I think the pastor is trying to say, that, uh, that let's hope that this Amatekun will not begin to conspire, regardless of how it's done. For me, the amnesty and the Niger Delta program was a blueprint that government should develop on in terms of resolving conflicts in the area. Now, it could not be by paying stipend, it could be by means necessarily that would build people's capacity to be entrepreneurs in themselves. All right. And that's how I look at it. Let me bring in Okura for, from Arochuku. Good morning, Mazi. Good morning, Mr. Anifa. Good morning, gentlemen, in the studio. Good morning. Good morning. Thank Thank you. You. Thank Honestly, again, gentlemen, and my brother, and if I the in the studio. The new security aspect the governors brought is a wake up development. Very, very. But what we should know that the staff must be trained and retrained quarterly, and the outfit has to be maintained. Payment, payment is very, very important because we are good in good policy, but in terms of implementation, it's always a problem. And the character of the people we are going to employ to work in that place also matters. Mm. Now, in those days, when I so when I when, so when I, I was doing the service, if you go to Bauchi to George, there was a sort of a vehicle. Like let's say for example, Lagos and Ibadan. There was a vehicle that is one is coming from Ibadan, one is going to Lagos, one is coming from Lagos. The internet they be passing by that the movies day in day at two four seven. It's not a question of the the just short uh, television uh, show. Just have like a cadaver, just your television with vehicles. <laughs> At the end of the day, they will just get a pass those because your gas will just carry the vehicles and go and keep and be feeling uh, funky. No, all these vehicles should be on the road 247. And the people in response to in terms of fueling, that you, it's not a question. Now, if you look at Niger Data issue and this one, there are two different things. Niger Data issue is different from the security act because Niger Data, the young men there and the young men we're talking about the resources. Mm. But this one, in terms of kidnapping and this one, so there are two things. Niger Data, and uh, uh, is it? Uh, I'm to quote. It's different. There are two <laughs> different things. So we have to look into the two things that they are not the same thing. Absolutely. Because in Nigeria, we are good in good policy, but mm. the question is implementation. And they should bring in people that are already carrot at the children, people that have cooker. Not all these boys that drink or go go and drink a mm. Drink all this nonsense, drink careful. When they go after drink, they just sit down in the car, be smoking all their, the, the, the latest sweet in the market. No, the two bring us the crucial people. People, there are a lot of graduates that are ready to do that type of job. Yeah. All right. As long as they will be paid, I bet you you get good people that not to go and recruit all these boys who take all this to go and all this. I think you've made a point. <laughs> Glad to have you called. So we've heard from the development agenda for Western Nigeria, who are saying that they are committed to employing educated people. I'm hoping that we get educated people amongst. Um, all of the groups that we've mentioned earlier. But again, attention is now being turned to the role that citizens must play 
in security. You know, prior to this time, we always look up to the security forces to mm. do the job. Yeah. But the bottom line here is that if we're going to be safe, everyone must be actively involved, mm. must not be scared about reporting, yeah. you know, suspicious movements in their areas. Just how ready do you think uh, people in the Southwest are to welcome and embrace this idea? I think this um, Amatekon has been as an, I mean, it's enjoying a kind of uh, public goodwill, yeah. you know, um, generally, at least up to 90%. And I think people are most likely to have trust in someone they know, someone they know very well, someone they have lived with, someone that they speak the same language, somebody that they trust, they have related with such individuals for years, so they know them, yeah. than someone that's, you know, just came maybe from nowhere, they are meeting for the first time. You know, so I believe the people on their own uh, have shown uh, enthusiasm towards this project. And you are optimistic that and they I'm will optimistic support. That they Let's will take our last support. call on the show this morning. Good morning, Ola Dipo from Adwekiti. I'm afraid that this problem with that um, uh, um, call, we can't take it. Uh, gentlemen, it's been a fantastic pair on the show this morning. I, I think that we'll have to bring you again because there's more to talk about. Dr. Chris Akio is a trained dental surgeon, president emeritus of the Ujo Youth Council. Thank you very much for finding time to come. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask you about the efforts of the Youth Council in Bayelsa recently. We understand that there was a protest where they shut down the PHCN company and there are talks to bring back light. Uh, in one minute, how well do you think such advocacy is going? Um, not much of force or violence, but um, civil called, protest. It's called, it's called non-violent direct action. Okay. Yeah, you, you must ask questions. First, the, 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 these people now who run the electric companies inherited uh, equipment and gadgets and power and gas from the, the government from taxpayers' money. They don't supply you light. They bring it for a day or two, then they go in and cut it out. But how's that effort coming? And, and so, is so there light, so, light now in so, Yenagoa? So, so there's, yeah. there, there's, still, there, there's still a sit tight until okay. that light electricity okay. comes. And we have to leave it there and, and find some other time to discuss this. Uh, senior colleague, veteran journalist, Wale Adoye, thank you very much for finding time thank to come. Much. Gentlemen, I thank you so sincerely for coming. That's our show today. Thank God it's Friday. Uh, no show on Saturday to Sunday. I mean, we can go back home and relax. We'll be back next week, God willing. On behalf of Uncle Yuri and the entire production crew, we say a big thank you. I am Nifemi Ogunto. God bless the Federal Republic of Nigeria.